Hello everyone, here am I again for a short talk in this Bioxcel summer school about our efforts using Haddock for drug repurposing against COVID-19. And this is yet another view of Pula where we should have all have been this week if it wasn't for COVID-19. So let's take first a look at uh, SARS-CoV-2 and a key protein which might be interesting to target in a uh, design of drugs to stop the virus. For this I'm going to use the following paper which was published quite recently in Nature and gives quite a nice and broad public overview of the key proteins, their function and how to potentially disarm them with drugs. And the first one of course of which you are probably all very well aware, and some of you have even been working on it, is the spike protein, which sits on the surface of the virus and interacts with the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 uh, to enter our cells. So a potential target to prevent cell entry will be to block these interactions. Another critical protein of the virus is the main protease. So when the virus uh, enters our cells, it delivers its uh, viral RNA, and the viral RNA is then uh, translated into uh, proteins, long strands of proteins in our cells. And one of the first protein produced is the main protease, also called M-PRO, but also 3CL-PRO, depending on nomenclature. And this protease is critical for the virus because it, because it cleaves the polypeptide chain produced into uh, functional proteins. And these are uh, the non-structural viral proteins which the virus needs for its further uh, life cycle. So by blocking the main protease, we can in principle block uh, this process. Now there are of course quite a number of structure of the main protease already available. Uh, they were homologous proteins from SARS-CoV-1 basically, but also recently uh, as a response to the pandemic and the structural biology has been working a lot on those systems and now you see here uh, a structure release on the 6th of May which is a crystal structure of the main protease with an uh, inhibitor bound to it. Now the third actor in this, uh, in this process uh, is yet another protein which is further down in uh, say the, the life cycle of the, the virus. It's the RNA dependent RNA polymerase also called RDRP. Now what does this protein do? It actually uh, <coughs> it produces viral RNA and this RNA is needed for the virus to increase the production of proteins but also to produce its own viral uh, RNA material to be packed into new virions. So if we can block this particular protein again we're going to block this, uh, this process, this RNA uh, production which will again stall the virus. Now the structural biology community again has been working hard in the last months to generate a structure of these and you see here one structure of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase which was published a few months ago in Science and this is a cryo electron microscopy structure at 2.5 angstrom resolution which contain triphosphate form of remdesivir, a well-known say antiviral or promising drugs in this case which uh, we've been hearing a lot about in the news. So we have structures for all, uh, all of those three key proteins. Now there is much more structure known about uh, the, the viral protein if you want to, to, to look more at the structural landscape of uh, the virus proteins you can take a look at this covidboyxl.eu slash proteins website which has been set up in collaboration with the small SSI uh, in the US and collects a lot of information about the structural, uh, the, stru the, the proteins of the virus, but also all kind of information about simulations, molecular dynamic simulations, uh, docking model and all of that. So it's a really a hub for uh, all the structural and modeling work done on the virus. Now, how are we going to target the virus uh, using Haddock? What are our strategies actually to perform small molecule docking in Haddock? Uh, we have three st main strategies that have been uh, used so far. So the classical one will be uh, what we call binding site driven docking and that's pretty much in line with what I've been telling you in the 
first lecture introducing ad hoc where we are going to define some information about the binding site. The second one, it's what we call the template-based uh, docking strategy. Here we need to rely on existing structure or homologous structure of the target protein with some other drugs. This is a strategy we developed along the Grand Challenge, D3R, a Grand Challenge. This is a blind competition for the prediction of protein small molecule uh, complexes to which we participated now for three times actually. And the last one is a rather new and recent uh, development in Haddock where we, it's also template based, so we need to have some structural information. But we're going to use a shape, basically shape information as restraints to drive the docking. So now I'm going to shortly explain you those three strategies before coming to the, actually the, the results of the screening that we have been doing. Now binding site driven docking is, is a classical ad hoc type of approach. Uh, in case of uh, small molecule uh, binding to a receptor, we usually know uh, the binding site on the receptor. So we're going to target th this binding site by defining the residue in the binding site as active in the ad hoc um, uh, setting. So active means that those redi residues should make contact with the ligand, otherwise there is a penalty. Now this is pretty similar, like if you think of small molecule docking software like Autodoc, there you define a box around the binding site. You never really target the, the entire protein, but you target your, your docking to a limited region. In the case of uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 proteins, we know actually where the, the active site is, so we can define uh, this information. Now in the rigid body docking stage, again, the ligand is defined as active. So what we have effectively is a set of restraints that are going to draw the ligands into the binding pocket at the rigid stage. Compared to our standard protein-protein docking, we increase the weight of the van der Waals uh, energy term in the scoring function to favor poses that have a good uh, van der Waals interaction. The default for protein docking will be 0.01. Now, in the second phase of the docking, where we're going to perform a flexible uh, refinement of the poses and, and final refinement in explicit solvent or not, uh, we change the restraints that we are using. So now only the ligand is active and the receptor binding site becomes passive. This allows the ligand to explore the binding site. It means that if some residues in the binding site are not contacting the ligand, there is no more penalty, energetic penalty for that. The only requirement is that the ligand should contact some residues in the binding site. So this gives freedom to the ligand to explore the binding pocket. We also change slightly our protocol for small molecule docking by removing the high temperature step in, a, in the simulated annealing part which is done here to, to refine the interface of the molecule and we also decrease slightly the temperature at which we do those uh, uh, simulations. Finally, we change for small molecule, this is rather a rather recent setting, we change the, the weight of the electrostatic intermolecular energy term to 0.1, so 10% of the score instead of 20%. And this protocol uh, has been described uh, in the paper showing our first participation to the uh, D3R Grand Challenge. So this is a classical ad hoc type binding site driven docking, but adapted to small molecule. Now the template-based approach is a different one. So for this, we need first to have available 3D model of uh, uh, related uh, receptors, homologous receptors, or ideally the same receptor that you are targeting, but with other ligands bound to it. Now to select which receptor we're going to use for the docking, <clears throat> we first look at what kind of ligands are bound to those receptors, and we're going to select the receptor which has the most similar ligand to the ligand that we have to dock. And we do this similarity measure by using the Tanimoto coefficient. And you see here two different ligands that share here a common substructure. So we select the receptor which has a ligand with the largest common substructure to the ligand that we have to dock. Now, how to sample ligand conformations? We do some flexibility during our docking, but often this is rather limited. So from the small string, which are a simple text string describing the chemistry of the ligand, we generate 3D conformers up to 500 pair ligands. So some of them don't reach 500 if they are only few rotatable bonds. And for this, we use the OpenEye Omega Toolkit, which is free for non-profit usage. 
So we find it quite um, performing very well to generate relevant conformation. Now we're going to, um, so in the receptor that we have selected contain a ligand, which has a given conformation. It's not the ligand we want to dock, but there's information in there. So we're going to compare the conformation, the shape of those 500 generated conformations with the shape of the ligands in our template receptor. And we do that by matching the shapes basically, and also matching kind of the pharmacophore model. And this is done using open eye rocks. So we're going to select the 10 best conformers out of the 500 that we selected, which have the high, highest combined score. And these 10 conformers will be given to ad hoc for ensemble docking. So we start from multiple conformation of the ligand. Now in this template-based docking protocol, which we use in D3R round three and four, so we skip the first two stages of ad hoc. So we don't do the rigid body docking. We don't do the flexible interface refinement. And we can do that because we superimpose the selected conformers onto the crystallographic ligands in the receptor that we selected. And this superposition is done using the OpenEye Shape TK software. And what we do is only run the final refinement stage of Haddock, basically this water refinement that you see here. So this was a very successful strategy in D3R Grand Challenge 3 and 4. Uh, this strategy has been published in this paper, so you can look up all the detail. And what you see here are the uh, 20 ligands that we had to predict for Grand Challenge 4. In yellow is the crystal structure, and in, um, in blue are all predictions. So we see we did uh, very well. So the, the top one, the medians of the top one poses for all those 20 is 1.5, and the best is 1.2. So this was a very successful uh, case. Now, we didn't follow this particular uh, template-based protocol for our efforts against COVID, but we follow a new protocol, which is still template-based. Um, but now we're going to use the ligand information from the template in a different way to define a shape that we will use during the docking. So the identification of the receptor and, uh, with the more similar ligand is the same. So we have a template structure which contains a ligand, which is the most similar to the ligands that we have to dock. We transform this ligand information into a shape and these are basically dummy atoms that are inside the receptor. And then we define restraints from the ligand that we have to dock to those shapes. Now, the way the restraints are defined depends on the, the size of the... So if the shape is larger than the ligand, we're going to define the restraints from the ligand to the shape, which will cause that the ligand should overlap with the shape, and vice versa. If the shape is smaller, we define the, the restraints from the shape to the ligand. And now we don't need to pre-select conformation, so we can use all the 500 conformation that we generated with OpenEye to dock into the receptor. So now we do again a full-fledged docking, but the advantage of the shape is that it can induce, it will select the most suitable conformation uh, to fit into it, and it will also induce more conformational changes during the, the refinement process. So that's the protocol that we're going to apply to some of the cases for this COVID work. So now coming to uh, our drug repurposing screen using Haddock against the three main uh, actors of the virus. So what did we do? We selected uh, approved small molecules from drug bank. So these are approved drugs that have passed clinical trial and are in use for all kinds of different applications. Uh, we wanted to limit uh, the system, we don't want to take very, very small molecules. There is all kind of stuff in drug bank, and we didn't want to take too large ones so that uh, these make reasonable drugs. We have an atom filter. We discarded any drug containing uh, metals, organometallic compounds, because simply our ad hoc server cannot handle those. The way that we generate the, the topology and the parameters for the small molecule is using prodrug, and we cannot handle organometallic compounds there. So this uh, gave us about 2,000 compounds from the uh, drug bank. We added a few more compound, compounds that are basically uh, the active form of some of the drugs. Some of the drugs are pro-drugs, meaning they need to be processed into those cells, into the active uh, component. For each of those, we generated up to a maximum of 500 conformation, again, using OpenEye. So not all ligands have this. 
and you see here the distribution of sizes in terms of number of atoms for the ligands that we selected. Now here are, uh, the, is the first actor, so that's the main protease, main pro, for which we have a crystal structure. Uh, all the work, by the way, has been done by uh, Manon Reo and Panos Kukost. Uh, they are both postdoc in my lab, and Panos was a former PhD student. So what did we do? The docking protocol. So there are quite a number of known ligands onto, uh, for, for this main protease, also from uh, SARS-CoV-1. And uh, in the last months, the Diamond Synchrotron released uh, quite a number of small fragment screening data sets. So they have been crystallizing the, the main protease with all kind of small molecule fragments. So we, have a, we use a set of 58 fragments uh, in the binding site and also some other structures with, with ligands. As known structure, so there are two of them, there is an apple and holoform, plus there are many additional structures. So this was our starting point of information for the receptor, and this is the starting point for the ligand. And the protocol that we follow here is the shape-based docking protocol that I just explained before. We also follow the slightly adapted version of our shape base, where we make use of pharmacophore information. So we're going to define a shape which represents the pharmacophore uh, information. So what you see here are all the, the small fragments and ligands that we extracted for the main protease. And from these, we derive a pharmacophore model. So we can represent still this pharmacophore model as a shape consisting of fake beads. But the beads now have properties that link them to a special type of, of atom. And when we define our restraints, we can make specific group of atoms uh, overlapping with specific beads in that case. So we did basically two screening, screening 2,000 compounds twice against the main protease. So how did we do the, this kind of computation? It's a lot of computation. So we could do the entire screening of 2,000 compounds in about three and a half days using uh, high throughput compute resources provided by the European Open Science Cloud project and also the, the EGI. Um, the web server of Haddock has been operating on this kind of resources since more than 10 years now, and this is what is powering all the machinery behind the server, allowing us to serve a large user community. And you see here uh, the, the, the week of, uh, so this was April, in about a week time you could see the number of jobs running at different sites around the, the world, so it's, this is more, a lot of sites are actually in Europe, but you find the open science grid here, you find sites in, in, in China, for example, this is Beijing. So all those sites are supporting uh, our efforts. Now what came out of all of this? Uh, so these are the results already. So you see here uh, on, on the bottom left, the top 10 compounds that come out of the screen. So you see the score for the pharmacophore model, for the shape-based telemonitor model, and here we report the best score of the two and this is how we rank the model. Now this table can be sorted as you wish and everything is available on the bonvinlab.org COVID site. There is also a graphical view of the results so you will see the Haddock score in arbitrary units. This is important to, to remark because these are not binding affinities and if you click, uh, if you hover over a, a point here it will tell you which drug it is. So when we look at the results, uh, so you have to be very careful when you do docking, it's in silico docking so it doesn't have to mean anything uh, relevant, but when you look at your top compounds, it was already uh, interesting to see in the top 10 here we have recovering three protease inhibitors, and if you look in the top 100, we find several drugs that are actually in clinical trial currently in Europe. So this was already a, a good sign that our scoring function is able to recover drugs that are actually uh, relevant for this. Now, just a side note, hydroxychlorine with chloroquine, which was mentioned as a potential uh, fantastic uh, solution to COVID-19, is not ranking very well in our screen. It's around uh, 800. Uh, now, the same was done for the RNA polymerase. This, the, the entire screen here took about six days because it was a larger system. We actually to cut some domains that were not relevant for the binding site that we are targeting. So here we didn't follow a shape-driven uh, a template shape driven docking protocol for the reason that there was not enough structural information to follow a template based protocol. So we went back to our say classical ad hoc binding site driven docking protocol. 
Again, you see here the top 10, everything is available online, so you can go look at it. And you see an interesting compound, which is the active form of uh, remdesivir, remdesivir triphosphate, which scores at number five. Now, here, currently we are also targeting now the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. So the idea here is to block the receptor in a rather closed form, which will prevent the binding to the spike protein, but these calculations are running as I speak. Now, if you have noticed carefully the ranking that I presented you, then you should become aware that there is, there is a potential problem with all this silico work. So we have what we will call frequent hitters. So the top rank compounds in both cases for the main protease and the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is ceftolazone, a beta-lactam inhibitor. And this is a highly polar compound. You see here the structure. So is this an artifact or is this a miracle drug? So one way of, of looking a little bit into that is to take a completely unrelated target. And in this case, we took uh, dehydra, uh, dehydrofolate reductase, which has nothing to do with the virus. We took the top 20 compounds predicted by uh, ranked by Haddock for the main protease and the uh, RNA polymerase. Together, these were 36 compounds, and we docked against DHFR. And you see that ceftolazone is also ranking on top for DHFR. But DHFR has nothing to do with the virus. So that's, that makes it very suspect. So it's a sticky compound that, that always score well. So you, you see here the, the DHFR rank, the main protease rank, and the RNA polymerase rank. So this one is one everywhere over the place. But for example, if you take the second compound for the main protease, it's ranked number two. It's ranking pretty poorly for the RNA polymerase, which makes sense. And it's only 20 uh, for the DHFR. So by looking at this kind of, uh, of analysis and data, we can exclude some drugs uh, for further testing. So where does this all take us in terms of conclusion and perspective? So we have been doing a screening of approved drug against the free targets. And the last one for AC2 is ongoing and should finish actually this week. Uh, the most interesting compounds for the main protease are actually being studied by, now by Molecular Dynamics in collaboration with uh, Attilio Varju and Giuliano Malocci from Calgary, who are also co-organizing co this uh, BioXL summer school. So a strategy to block the virus waiting for a potential vaccine will be to design a cocktail of drugs as is done for HIV. We still have no vaccine for HIV, and uh, the, the therapies these days are using cocktails of drugs that are targeting different proteins, like the three main actors I discussed about. Of course, all of these predictions will need to be validated, and we are planning to do that in collaborations with, uh, with people in Utrecht and also in the context of a large European uh, innovative medicine initiative project. What could also provide insight into the validity of our predictions are epidemiological data, meaning that by analyzing patients that have suffered from COVID-19, and we might see that some group of patients have less affected by the virus than others, and those groups were maybe already taking some drugs, which are in the, in the screen that we are be, uh, doing. So if this kind of data become available, we can cross-check our predictions. To finish with, I want to acknowledge the people who have been doing most of the work. So this is Panos and, uh, and Manon in my group. You've seen their pictures. I want also to acknowledge Ed Moritz from the Pharmaceutical Sciences Department, who has all the knowledge about all these drugs and is collaborating with us in, in coming to some prediction of what could be a potential uh, cocktail, which will then go into testing. And of course, the entire lab for uh, every, all their contribution and our funding uh, for supporting all our work, including, of course, BioExcel. Thank you very much for your attention.